Hi, everyone. My name is Amaedu. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology and African studies in the MIT anthropology department. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second session of our first day of the Justice Now Symposium on tackling legacies of Europe's colonial past. Um, a couple of um, technical points. Um, we have simultaneous translation being provided between French and English. And so if you have the latest version of Zoom, you should see a globe next to your leave button at the bottom of your screen that gives you the option of hearing um, the simultaneous translation in this case in French, um, because all the presentations today will be mostly in English, though I know there will be some uh, Creole Haitian that will be in there um, with Michel Dudhoff's presentation. Um, and you have the option of muting the audio, the original audio also, if you do the simultaneous translation. We also have closed captioning, but only for English. And so again, in this session, it's, it doesn't change anything, but essentially if you click on this live transcript button, which has two Cs um, and is labeled live transcript next to the interpretation button, you should be able to see subtitles on your screen. And you also have the option of seeing a transcript um, on the side of your image. And that's only for English, right? So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if you attended the previous session um, in the, our very powerful lecture, Diepo Lopeco laid out some of the core defining features of colonialism, including land disposition, extractivist logics, and the attendant dehumanization of Black and Indigenous bodies, um, as well as the ideology of white supremacy. She spoke to the, to the pervasiveness and endurance of these structures across both geography and time, effectively making visible the foundations of contemporary structural racism. Now, given these violences, their depth, their endurance and pervasiveness, the question of what justice should look like extends to a field as well as, 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 as wide as the injustices, right? Um, and there've been a number of mediatized gestures towards justice, and perhaps the most mediatized among them have been demands ranging from economic reparations to the, rest the restitution by African museums of artifacts and human remains taken from former colonies in Africa to their rightful owners, um, to demands for the removal of monuments celebrating slavery or colonialism. Now for this panel, we've invited a group of scholars to reflect on this question, what justice should look like from various perspectives, some of which are at the forefront of discussions and others less so. Um, so Professor Mam Fatun Young will reflect on social reforms and that's very broad, but we'll see in her presentation exactly the angle she takes there. Professor Brian Kuoba will speak on the decolonization of public space. Professor Michel de Graff will focus on language and education. Dr. Malcolm Ferdinand on environmental justice and Ms. Shada Islam on foreign policy. All of these speakers' work spans a range of disciplines, but also a range of geographic locations, European, Caribbean, American, and transnational. So we are so excited. I am so excited to engage in conversation with you all. Thank you all for inviting, for accepting our invitation. Um, the way this will go is that I will introduce each speaker before their remarks. Each presentation will be brief, just 10 ish minutes, um, we asked the, pres the presenters for hard hitting propositions to our question, what should justice look like, right? And so I'm hoping that we will have time for more um, question and answer after the, the presentations. And I very much look forward to our discussion afterwards. All right, with that being said, I will introduce our first speaker, Professor Mam Patun Young. Uh, Dr. Mam Fatun Young is Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Carnegie Mellon University, and she is the author of Identité Française, which was published in 2019. She's also a photographer and a co-author of a photo series on Black French Islam. In 2015, uh, Professor Nyang co-directed Maria Noir, Mosaïque Afropéenne with Katie Nielsen. The film follows seven Afro-French women as they investigate the pieces of their mosaic identities and unravel what it means to be Black and French, what it means to be Black in France. And I have to say, um, um, Professor Nyang, we just watched this, this film with my students in our class last week, and they were so moved. Um, one of... Mm -hmm. and, 
several <laughs> of the students are first generation Americans of West African descent. And one of them said, it made me feel like I'm not the only one in this situation. Yeah, and it was just so powerful. So I hope they're here too. I told them she's coming, she's coming. You have to come near her. Um, all right, and Professor Nyang is currently working on a second manuscript tentatively titled Mosaica Nigra, Blackness in 21st Century France. With that, Professor Nyang, we are all ears. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ama, for, for the invitation. And thank you for what you said about the movie, because that's exactly why I made the movie. Because I felt alone and I wanted to feel less alone. So I'm happy to see that, you know, five years on, five years later, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm sharing this with, with people beyond my country. So yes, um, my name is Mom. I am an associate professor. I'm Afro-French. I'm Black and French. I come from a country that claims to be blind to color but a country that asks me to, to go back to Africa the minute I go beyond the two frames of, of um, public intervention that are available to me, um, silence and gratitude. As soon as I go out, I encroach out of these two enclosures, I will be more or less politely, more or less violently asked to return to Senegal, a country that my family left in 1835. How dare I question, how dare I doubt, criticize, how dare I build new plans, how dare I think about new horizons, how dare I think from new horizons, how dare I reshuffle the maps of our Republican cosmovisions, how dare I call myself noir, black, how dare I call myself Afro-French, how dare I hyphenate the French identity that has been sacralized as une indivisible, one indivisible. I come from a country, France, that promotes its goals. You know, these formidable, we call them social elevators, these giant Republican erasers that level out any social or ethnic disadvantage. But a country where I, a former student of, a, of an elite French prep school and now an associate professor at the prestigious American university, I remain a hood rat, a banlieue scum, une racaille de banlieue in the eye and the mouth of a préfet de la République, a high-ranking French official. And I guess in my country, class still does not erase race. I'm part of a generation of French people of foreign descent, as we are called, um, students who left France in the mid 2000s, mainly for the USA and for some of us to Canada, and a generation that was both stunned, paralyzed, but also absolutely energized by the extraordinary racism that were displayed during those, those years, the Sarkozy years, and who took Nicolas Sarkozy's at his word, you know, when he said, la France, on l'aime ou on la quitte, la France, love it or leave it, we left. And in the US, my first week at Brown University, I discovered that hip hop was an academic discipline. I discovered that ethnic studies were a thing. But most importantly, I discovered Fanon, Césaire Glissant. I heard for the first time about Marie Scondé, Asia Djeba, Robert Orff, Paulette Jeanne Nardal, Jeanne Martin Sissé, names that I had never heard of in my entire life in France. French artists, writers, philosophers, thinkers, people who, like me, were born um, from France's colonial history, and people who were thinking about what it was to be French, but in the margins, right? To be French and erased from national consciousness, to be French and be erased from history, memory, to be erased from the families for the album. In the US, and I say this often, I discovered that one could be Black and French. And today I look at my country from the USA, where I've been living for the past 16 years, and I see a country that is afraid. I see the irrationality of somehow of our foundation exploding in broad daylight and, you know, these gaps between discourses, principles and reality being exposed. And, and instead of examining these flaws, we lock ourselves into this Republican jargon, you know, we juggling with words that are emptied, juggle, you know, tossed around, reinvested, words like woke, cancel culture, Islam or leftism. And it's like incapable at looking at itself in the mirror, France, um, you know, from this mirror that is being held from, from its margin, France to the center is, is having a breakdown before our very eyes. I come from a country that builds race, a country that builds itself, built its fortune on race, a country that still operates on race, but pretends that erasing the word from its ecosystem has magically dissolved racism and coloniality. Our panel today is, um, 
is entitled what should what should justice look like and and this is a deep question you know we're, we're working on it and before i start i want to answer a question that is slightly similar which is what does injustice look like i will share my screen with you and for me injustice looks like this can everybody see my screen can you all see it okay so this is the fresco commemorating the the first time French, France abolished slavery in 1794. It's been at the French National Assembly, the French Parliament for the past 60 years. And in 2019, my colleagues, uh, Bryn Mars, uh, Julien Ciodo and I unleashed a tsunami from the far right to the far left when we called it out. This is at the French Parliament. I mean, we heard it all. Um, this piece could not be racist because one, it commemorates abolition of slavery and two, race simply does not exist in France. We were the racists trying to import it in France. We were called ignorant, um, um, incapable of seeing it for what it was, a fun attempt at caricature, a piece of irony in the purest French tradition. We were called ayatollahs issuing a fatwa against the artist, Hervé de Rosa, and people cited Voltaire, Charlie Hebdo, the sacredness of art, and arguing that this, this was art, and as such was free to shop. And we were repeatedly told that people never learned in school that these signs were harmful, that these signs were racist. So in the, I'll stop sharing it because it makes me sick to my stomach to say this thing. So in the 16 years that I've been working on blackness, race and racism in France, I've truly never seen anything like the wave that swept through France, you know, through the country following the death of George Floyd last year. Hundreds of thousands of people mobilized all over the country, the biggest anti-racism movement in, in contemporary history. And like many, you know, friends, colleagues, um, family members, I felt that we were riding an unprecedented wave. And I usually hate the word unprecedented, but really we were living something big. You know, this, this, what I usually call it the gush, a gush that finally disintegrated the Republican dam, that barrier that often contain works on race and memory in France. And that hope was kind of short-lived as the backlash of the movement was extremely strong and swift and came from the highest levels of the state, starting you know, this important political sequence with President Macron in June, accusing university campuses um, and social scientists of being, in his own words, secessionists, of breaking the Republic in two, of um, ethnicizing the social questions, of turning it into a business, a profitable business. He, they called it the business of race and of luring young people in the streets by selling them false hope. I can also think, you know, most recently, of the Minister of Higher Education, Frédéric Vidal, who called for an official inquest into the dictatorship of minorities and activism and, you know, anti-French activities, anti-white sentiments on, on French camp campuses, as well as what he called, I think, the ravages of Islamo leftism on campuses. And in this world, in my country today, the Republic, Frenchness, universalism, and free speech are thought to be under attack under attack by gender and race obsessed tra traders like me who are arbitrarily projecting onto France and onto you know our country realities that are and notions that are imported from abroad and when I say abroad I'm looking at you the United States you know people who are ready to cancel anybody who doesn't who don't um who doesn't agree with them so this is where we are now you know we are working hard to raise questions that France is fighting even harder to keep in the dark. How do we educate people on memory in a country where the construction of memory is a private turf, you know, like the, the exclusive domain of the state? How do we work on race in a country where race simply does not exist? Um, how can we use memory and, and, and remembrance to, to fuel social and, and, and political actions on issue as diverse and, and link you know, our past and our present on issues as diverse as police violence, uh, racial inequality and access to, to education, access to employment, access to housing, healthcare services, um, to raise um, you know, um, alarm on issues like environmental issues. And I think that Malcolm will talk a little bit about that environmental issues such as the chlordecone poisoning or industrial pollutions in, in, in the banlieue. What do we do with the, the limitations of the current universalist debate in France, but also the violence that the very terms of the debates, the way the debates is being led in France, unleash 
you know, this violence that it unleashes on, on minorities and racialized communities? How, how do I fight against racism when liberal values or um, Republican values such as free speech are used and turned against minority communities to further shun them, hurt them, erase them? How do we create and maintain dialogue when, when the, my own country is in a monologue? So through bodies like mine, France is forced to face its coloniality and its history, right? It's, it's forced to reopen pages long seal. And in order to think about the future, we will have to talk about Haiti and Toussaint. We will have to explain why France ratified two abolitions. We will have to talk about the colonies. We will have to talk about this past. And we will have to realize that universalism is a horizon. It's a project, a horizon that the Republic has never really reached. It's been an ideal that suffered multiple, multiple blows and exceptions, such as late access of right for women, the institution of slavery, the code of indigena, and so on and so forth. And our myth was built on a common desire to embody and protect a set of value. And today, the reality of this community is questioned by a generation of people, of which I'm part, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of, a generation that has experienced otherness, that has been shunned, erased, and a generation that now refuses to live under the yoke of an ossified myth and women's silence. I'm Black and I'm French. That's what justice looks like. <laughs> Merci. Thank you so much for that, Nan. Thank you. Um, so many thoughts, so many reactions, um, and I have taken note of them, and we will come back to them in the discussion. But thank you so much for bringing this perspective um, on the possibilities and the the they yeah, the possibilities and compat the compatibilities of blackness and frenchness right as what justice can look like should look like all right our next presentation um, will be by professor brian koba who is assistant professor of african-american history at the university of memphis um, his research centers um, on the political thought and social movements among people of African descent in the United States and across the globe. While completing his doctoral degree at Oxford, Dr. Koba co-founded the Oxford Pan-African Forum and Rose Must Fall in Oxford Movements. Um, and he has been an activist on issues ranging from LGBT equality and anti-imperialism to immigrant workers' rights and the movement for Black lives. Um, again, showing us, bringing us an example of um, intersectionality and of the relevance of these different struggles for justice. Um, Dr. Koba is currently working on a book for the University of North Carolina Press about the unsung pioneer of Black radicalism, Hubert Henry Harrison. And today he will be speaking to us on the theme of public space as we reflect on what justice should look like. Brian, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Ama, and all the organizers and people who made this possible. I know it takes a lot of work to pull something like this off, and I'm grateful to be invited. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen uh, because I do have some slides, um, and so hopefully that will, you know, make for a more interesting and dynamic presentation. Um, I'm also going to probably speak fast because I have a lot to say. Um, but in any case, let's just jump into it. So. Um, I'm gonna basically try to do three things. One, I wanna share some, some epigrams uh, or quotes that are inspiring my thoughts today. Number two, I wanna talk about roads must fall, public statues and decolonizing education. And third, um, I just wanna make some links between that struggle and some of the realities um, that, that we're seeing, you know, witnessing today. So um, <clears throat> just to start off uh, with a couple of quotes, um, the first one is uh, actually from Hubert Harrison, who uh, I am writing a book on. Um, and he says, whenever large groups, the question was, you know, who can even think justice, <laughs> right? He says, quote, whenever large groups of men find profit and injustice to other men, they will evolve a system of ethics to reconcile their minds to that justice. They cannot continue to do wrong without calling that wrong right. That is why the capitalist class cannot even think justice so far as the workers are concerned. And that is why men who think they can see a social or economic advantage for themselves in the degradation of the Negro will continue to think that degradation right. Um, and I, this quote came to mind because again, when we're thinking about justice, um, I, I think Harrison has a point here, uh, you know, over a century ago uh, about cognitive justice, right? That, that um, not everybody is even positioned to think justice. 
Um, another related quote uh, is this idea that those who are most affected by an injustice are best positioned to respond or to address it. Uh, this is Selma James. She says, in order, and this is in more of a Marxist framework, if you're into that. Um, she says, quote, in order for the working class to unite in spite of the divisions which are inherent in its structure, uh, factory versus plantation versus home versus schools, those at the lowest levels of the hierarchy, and she means, of course, race and gender hierarchies uh, and, and things, those who are at the lowest levels of the hierarchy must themselves find the key to their weakness, must themselves find the strategy which will attack that point and shatter it, must themselves find their own modes of struggle. And then uh, I have a quote about reparations too, because I think when we're thinking about justice, you know, people who are most oppressed or most uh, at the bottom of the hierarchies need, need to, to have some type of repair. Uh, this is from the Nigerian scholar Chinwezu. He says, money is not 1% of what reparation is about. Reparation is mostly about making repairs, self-made repairs on ourselves, mental repairs, psychological repairs, cultural repairs, organizational repairs, social repairs, institutional, technological, economic, political, educational, repairs of every type that we need in order to create sustainable black societies. Um, and so this again is just more of an invitation to think broadly about justice, about who can think justice and about from which directions. And then, uh, let me skip Cecil Rhodes because I think we know Rhodes <laughs> well enough. Uh, I'll say more about him in a second. And this is just something I, I thought of just now on backlash and this question of backlash. Um, to those accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Um, I don't usually quote Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she's deeply implicated in white supremacy and coloniality. Um, but I think this is a great quote. <laughs> so that's why I included it. Um, so yeah, let me talk a little bit about Rhodes Must Fall. Um, I mean, of course, the movement started in Cape Town, uh, at the University of Cape Town. And uh, there's a statue of Cecil Rhodes, this noxious British colonialist, probably the, the, the symbol of colonialism. If you had to pick one person to, you know, to, to symbolize, uh, Cecil Rhodes is a good choice. And so a student had thrown um, excrement on the statue and this ignited a huge debate, which became a huge movement of black students uh, primarily and led by black students to challenge uh, coloniality at the University of Cape Town. So I'm just showing some images uh, from that moment. This was in the spring uh, or March of 2015. They had mass uh, meetings, um, general assembly meetings. They started uh, protesting the statue, um, calling for its removal, you know, decorating it um, in different ways. Uh, they would have marches, they would have rallies, they would have street theater in order to dramatize the injustices of colonialism. Uh, and what Cecil Rhodes did in, in Southern Africa. They took over the administration building um, and you know, started basically, um, they renamed it the Azania House um, rather than the name that it had before. They brought in guest uh, speakers to speak about decolonization, what it might look like to decolonize education. They did power mapping. Um, I'm sure many of you, you know, were following this and eventually they succeeded um, in bringing down the roads or having the statue removed, the statue of Cecil Rhodes removed. Of course, a lot of people didn't realize that the statue was meant to be a, a doorway into a larger conversation. In fact, Rhodes Must Fall in South Africa had 27 demands, uh, not just about statues, but about the representation of uh, lecturers and faculty members, demands about curriculum, demands about sexual assault, demands about uh, outsourcing and um, some of the unjust labor practices and so on and so forth. And so we were inspired by this. I was a grad student at Oxford at the time watching this movement unfold and saying, hey, <laughs> we have a Rhodes statue here in Oxford uh, and a number of other you know, um, colonial symbols that we could be talking about too. So we started to build a solidarity campaign with the black students in South Africa which quickly turned into a sort of campaign of its own uh, to decolonize Oxford itself and to, and to, to fight in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, we had general assembly meetings, we had protests, um, we had a big debate at the Oxford Union, which, um, which we won. Um, and we were trying to explain to people that, you know, basically um, there's, there's this statue at our institution that is, that is that is really obnoxious, not only for Black Southern Africans, 
uh, but for anybody who is concerned with justice because um, you know, Rhodes profited and made his wealth uh, and built the De Beers Diamond Company out of the labor of Black Southern Africans. Um, we ended up challenging diversity as a framework, uh, saying don't diversify but decolonize. This is a picture from that action because we could saw we saw how the university was using the language of diversity um, to kind of avoid some of the deeper transformational questions we were raising. Um, we reached out to, to Black trade unionists. Um, we had marches, you know, very similar to the campaign uh, in South Africa. And sorry if I'm going fast, but I just have so much to share. Uh, here's a die-in we did at the Rhodes House, uh, which is located in Oxford, just dramatizing again, the brutality of Cecil Rhodes. Um, also, for those who want more information, I can't help but, but share this book because I was one of the co-editors um, this book we put together to, to really, you know, try to give voice to the various dimensions of the movement, not only in the UK, but uh, in the US, South Africa, Palestine, and, and other places. Um, and, and, and nearly half of the contributions are from Black women, which we were really happy, happy to, uh, to, to produce. And then, of course, just last year, uh, the original campaign was, was in 2015, 2016. Um, and then just last year, in the wake of the George Floyd protest, there was, there was a huge resurgence, uh, a sort of roads must fall 2.0, uh, which is pictured here from above, a, a massive action right outside the Rhodes statue on the high street of Oxford. Um, and I was excited to see that because I had been away from Oxford and thought, you know, our movement had, had kind of died down. Um, so yeah, there's a number of symbols I could talk about at Oxford, the Rhodes House, the Codrington Library is another one we targeted. This is named for Christopher Codrington, uh, one of the biggest plantation owners in Barbados. Um, we had the support of people like Michelle Codrington, who is a descendant of the enslaved Africans that Christopher Codrington owned. She's a trade unionist, a teacher, and an Oxford resident um, who had a very powerful voice within, within our movement in terms of just the Codrington name. Um, we could talk about Barclays and Lloyds and, and these banks that uh, got rich off of, of slavery and were targets of the anti-apartheid activism in the 80s. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about our demands. We had demands around representation because there are so few black uh, professors, only 0.4% of UK professors are black. Um, curriculum was another big demand of ours, the way in which um, you know, most of the humanities are just so thoroughly Eurocentric and, uh, you know, whether it's English, whether it's political science, whether it's philosophy, whether it's history, um, there's just so much, so there's so much of a lack of, of non-Western voices, um, of women's voices in the curriculum, and we wanted to challenge that. Um, let me skip ahead to, we also had to make this point because we didn't have a lot of white students in our movement, and most of the ones we had were actually not from the UK, but from other other European countries are from the US. Um, we had to make this point that that white curriculum is bad for white students too because it fosters a superiority complex in them, uh, sustains white supremacy, um, and makes it harder for us actually to deal with the climate problem <laughs> because you can't solve a problem from the same consciousness that created it. Um, and white Western, you know, civilization so-called is, is what has created this problem. And so we were encouraging people to look to indigenous people who are leading the struggle for climate justice uh, and have a track record of working in harmony, living in harmony with nature. Um, so one of the questions that came up was what to do with these statues. Um, and whoops, I have a typo here. Anyway, uh, one of the th options we said was put, put it in the museum. You know, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford has a lot of empire exhibits, but nothing on the British Empire. <laughs> and so let's, let's talk about that, right? Use Rhodes to talk about that. Of course, there's also the Bristol option. I was gonna show a video of this, but um, I, I don't think I have time. So I'll just say that people, you know, the people of Bristol pulled down the statue of Edward Colston, the noxious slave trader, and threw it in the river. Um, I think that's another great thing to do because it empowers people and, and it's kind of a people's form of justice. There have been a ton of statues of Columbus that have come down, uh, Christopher Columbus that have come down in the US uh, again last summer in the wake of the George Floyd protests. Um, and then of course the Confederate statues. Uh, I teach at Memphis, there were two statues taken down about three or four years ago of Confederate uh, Jefferson Davis and um, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, and of course, this, this has gone into other places. Here's one example from the, fr the Francophone world, right? The statue of Napoleon's wife in Martinique, 
that was torn down last summer in the wake of the George Floyd protests. Um, and so lastly, I'll just end on this point about moving from statues and symbols to, to deeper realities and structural problems. Um, I think statues are a great starting point for a conversation, but we in the movement always saw it as something that would lead to bigger conversations and taking down not just the legacies of empire, but the ongoing realities of empire, right? So we could talk about killing a million Iraqis for oil. Uh, we could talk about the drone strikes. We could talk about um, just the situation, if we're, if we're thinking about Africa, the situation of Western interests, uh, quote unquote, all the, the oil and um, other natural resources that, uh, you know, Western countries are after. There is a cancerous French military presence in Africa, uh, which is depicted, you know, in this, in this graphic. Um, there is a cancerous US military presence in Africa, uh, which is depicted in this graphic. Um, we can, we can imagine that Britain and, and some of the other imperial players also have a huge presence on the continent. Uh, Britain in particular, you know, has invaded nine out of 10 countries in the world. Um, and that's why the, the response I think to our movement was so apoplectic. I mean, just, just visceral by the British media uh, because the imperial culture is so deeply embedded um, in British, you know, in British society. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just end on a point about why this work matters, which is that the people who are trained at Oxford um, are oftentimes the one who are, uh, the, who are enacting these realities uh, on the world, right? So for example, uh, Susan Rice, you know, was a Black Rhodes Scholar, someone who was actually recently under consideration for the vice president's, uh, the vice presidential uh, slot with Joe Biden. Of course, Kamala Harris ended up getting it, but um, she, she's someone who, you know, um, has a, a, a track record of imperialism. <laughs> most, most recently, she was the architect of the UN Security Council resolution, which authorized the destruction of Libya. Um, you know, for those of us who were, who, who were concerned about that, it struck me how the, there were two of the major war criminals were actually Oxford trained, not only Susan Rice, but also David Cameron, uh, the prime minister of Britain at the time. And so again, it's just one example of, um, the ways in which you know the conversation can't just be about legacies and the legacies of empire. We have to talk about the ongoing realities and operations of, of empire uh, if we really want to change the bigger picture. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks so much again to everyone for being here. Great, hey, thank you so much, Brian, for that presentation and for giving us a sense of um, sort of the act the activism on the ground and in these um, in the um, roads must fall movement um, in uh, in Oxford, and also for making the link between um, public spaces and statues and decolonization of education more broadly which actually um, is a very nice segue into our next presentation by Michel de Graff. Um, uh, so Michel, Professor Michel de Graff is a professor of linguistics at MIT and co-founder of the MIT Haiti Initiative, as well as a founding member of Académie Creole Haitien. His research and writings engage intellectual history and critical race theory, especially the links between power knowledge hierarchies and the misrepresentations and misuses of Creole languages and their speakers. Um, Dr. de Graaf's work is anchored in a broader agenda for human rights and social justice, with his native Haiti as one spectacular case indeed of post-colonies where the national language spoken by all, Haitian Creole, is disenfranchised while the colonial language spoken by a few, French, is enlisted for elite closure and geopolitical control. And these are some of the issues that the MIT Haiti Initiative tackles um, as it tries to democratize access to quality education in Haiti. And so today, Michel will be speaking to us about what justice should look like from the standpoint of language and education. So thank you so much, Michel, and we are all yours. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Do you all see my, my, my screen? Great. So actually, I'm going to speak about what will justice sound like from the perspective of myself as a Haitian language and educator tackling both the legacies, and I like what Brian mentioned, the ongoing neo-colonial context. And because justice is a huge word, 
um, I'm going to focus on one, just one necessary, though it's not sufficient, building block, the sound of justice, which too often go unheard, even by those fighting for justice, even or especially when these sounds come from the mouth of children, say like Rachel Gentile, the star witness for the prosecution at the trial of Zimmerman, what killed Trevon Martin in cold blood. This is the very trial that launched Black Lives Matter, although we forget the, the role that language played in that trial. In fact, one of my theses is exactly that, that language is too often the canary in the minefield of injustice. So what does justice sound like? In other words, what's the role of language in justice now? So to be efficient with time, time is short, I've made a little video collage to display what justice should sound like in a world that ideally would respect the human rights of every child. So for show and tell, I'm going to share a very biased sample of Haitian children, all of them in just one very special school called L'Ecole Communauté Matenois. In the remote village of Matenois, on the island of Lagunave, which is off the main island of Haiti, very remote. So first we'll hear the students honing the literacy skills in the native Haitian Creole while singing the Creole alphabet song, which myself and my colleague Mendali Richard we composed. Creole is the native language of every Haitian, with French spoken fluently by only a small minority, at most 5%, keep that in mind. And then you'll hear Prisla and Jerry Cam, also in, in Matenois, singing and dancing while learning math, learning please value. And then you'll hear Johnny Ka, a fourth grader, telling us exactly why he values the sound of justice in Creole. Okay, so let's listen. <laughs> So in my analysis, this is what justice should sound like. But now I need to remind you that in reality, we still need to tackle the devastating impact of European imperialism in the realm of language education, which as you'll see, is also the realm of politics and geopolitics. Professor Marlene Do in the New York Times just last week reminded us that in France, the year 2021 is the year of Napoleon, though Napoleon is an icon of white supremacy and is the only figure, historical figure, who actually re-established slavery after it was abolished in Martinique and Guadeloupe. He tried to do that in Haiti as well, but he failed miserably, which the French like to forget. Another fact that the French and too many of us like to forget, which Marlene Do also likes to remind us of, Messi Marlene, is that France still enjoys its having stolen more than 20 billion US dollars from Haiti through gunboat diplomacy in the 19th century. This colonial past is not past. Haiti still suffers from this theft in the very present. Just ask former President uh, Aristide. In the 21st century, language and education are doing a great deal of the work that was done by boats and canons in the, in the 18th and 19th century. La francophonie century. est également un élément qui nous unit, Haïti faisant partie justement des membres fondateurs, et je souhaite que nous puissions encourager toute la région de manière très concrète, et nous allons nous y employer, les initiatives que vous prenez en ce sens. 
Au cours de nos échanges, nous avons convenu de renforcer les liens commerciaux entre les deux pays. La coopération en matière d'éducation à tous les niveaux, surtout l'enseignement supérieur et la formation professionnelle. Vous pouvez compter sur nous. Nous sommes en train de travailler pour, pour que le français, comme nous l'avons si bien dit, qui est notre langue officielle, soit en fait euh, euh, une langue, la langue de la CARICOM aussi. Et nous sommes en train de travailler pour que nos frères de la Martinique et de la Guadeloupe puissent participer aussi euh, dans ce grand mouvement de la CARICOM, parce que la CARICOM, ce sont des pays de la Caraïbe, et je pense que Maman Martinique et Guadeloupe font partie aussi de la CARICOM. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci, messieurs, dames. So, as you might have heard in this speech, Macron closes the meeting with thanks in Creole, after Moïse himself claims falsely that Haiti has one single official language, French. In reality, as you've heard before, Haiti has two official languages, Creole and French. And Creole is legally Haiti one national language. So with such an exchange that you just saw between Macron and Moïse, it should be no surprise that the Ministry of Education in Haiti, in its latest curricular reform dated December 2020, excludes Creole as language of teaching from fifth grade elementary school onward in a country where most teachers and most students are fluent in Creole only. According to this reform, studying the fifth grade, even the teaching of Creole <laughs> must be done in French, basically using the unknown to teach about the known. So, and these photos show some of the price that children today have to pay for the kind of francophonie that Macron and Moïse and the governments are pushing mercilessly on the Creole swing population. And that hegemony is also what we find in the justice system, which we should just call the injustice system, because the majority of Haitians, Creole speaking, Blacks, are still by and large disempowered, not only in schools, but in all institutions through the exclusion of Creole. So I'm glad that Avocat Sans Frontières, ASF, co-sponsored this symposium because long before I knew about this conference, I reached out to Taina Nuster at ASF to help fight this fight in Haitian courts. Even UNESCO in Haiti doesn't fully practice what it preaches when it comes to human rights and linguistic diversity. The meetings in Haiti are mostly in French, the language of exclusion, even when the meetings are about inclusive education. So with all this in mind, what does justice actually sound like in Haiti today in the realm of education? So this is a small sample in Creole, so you too can hear what justice should sound like in Haiti. Haiti, c'est pas ni un pays, néocolonial côté nous toujours en bas domination langue ancien colonial et ça c'est la cause échec dans pif pour l'école et ça c'est la cause sous développement pays d'Haïti et tu veux dire que français toujours servi comme zame pour violence coloniale domination politique économique et pour démonification et impactant vraiment mal ouais um, parce que ça me garde échec que ça vient de créer, l'école tête en bas, ça y est, nous sommes créés ce développement, mais ça a tout mené nous dans la médiocrité, dans tout niveau, à tout niveau de la société, nous avons une médiocrité, et nous parlons par exemple de médiocrité, ça nous avons une corruption dans tout secteur, une grosse corruption, nous avons une impunité à la ronde de côté ministre, député, sénateur, professeur, nous tout fait ça, nous avons dit que nous qui tête en bas, et pourtant, nous n'avons aucune conséquence pour ça. Qui donc nous gagne un, un état démonifié et qui va nous donner une économie qui, qui triste en pile. Et là, nous voyons ça. Sous 51 pays qui ont évalué dans le World Economic Forum, Haïti est net dans le monde, dans 138e position. Le problème est que ça vient créer de, de, une situation de misère qui est vraiment uh, terrible. Et puis tout, à ta famille, c'est là yo, qui n'a pas souffert d'abandon, qui n'a pas souffert d'échec, qui réussit, qui soit disant réussi, qui ça nous voit? Nous avons des gens qui ont une grosse position, par exemple, nous parlons de un directeur de l'école, un directeur de lycée, qui n'a pas même fait un discours 
dans la langue française qui était servi sur l'école pendant 13 années. Ok, donc entre les vidéos ça. Je suis vraiment ravi, enchanté de prendre la parole à l'occasion de ce grand événement marquant mon installation comme le nouveau directeur du lycée des Bois de Permettez-moi que je suis paraphrase. Un grand auteur qui est dit, qui est anti, et je cite, c'est la valeur qui faut être la valeur de la valeur et qui met en valeur une valeur. Donc ça, c'est un directeur, un lycée dans Pétionville qui n'a pas fait un discours deux minutes en français. Ouais, donc, et ça, dans la vidéo, ça, qui est une tragédie, une tragédie, un directeur de qui n'a pas parlé la langue de la pensée. Et nous jouons même histoire ça tous les jours, dans tout le pays. Il y a un pays côté, c'est la seule langue créole là, qui est toute population en chemin de chemin de So, and now, let's ask, what must justice sound like in Haiti and more generally in the global south? in the realm of education. So this is our own response at MIT Haiti based on three pillars, the mother tongue, active learning, technology, where the mother tongue, Creole, is a necessary tool to promote active learning, which can also be enhanced by technology writ large. And the outcome of our efforts is a library of tools in Creole for active learning of STEM. And we already have some very good results, which you can consult in our publications like this paper by Glenda Stump and myself. Indeed, we are making the sounds of justice be heard in schools in Haiti and beyond. And since 2019, my colleague in mathematics, um, Hint Miller and myself, with support from Jamil World Education Lab, JWL at MIT's Open Learning, we've launched Platform MIT IET, which is a game changer as we're now crowdsourcing Creole materials from Haitian educators in Haiti and abroad materials in all subjects and at all levels. So I'm going to stop now and hoping that this can trigger um, provocation and discussion because the model that we're trying to launch is not just for Haiti, it's for the global south where 40% of children are being taught in a language which you don't speak, which means that they're being mistaught from the get-go. So thanks to you and thanks to our team members near and far, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for tuning us or challenging us to expand our sensory apparatus, right? And to recognize the ways that language can actually point us into the, the same kind of profound dynamics of disenfranchisement and colonial violence. Um, and yes, so much more to say about that. And thank you so much. I'm so excited to learn more about the MIT Haiti Initiative. Haiti initiative. Um, and we will come back to all of this in the discussion. For now, let me introduce our next speaker. So we're going from language and the individual and the way that plays out um, at a structural level to now thinking about environmental justice, right? So we're, we're jumping scales and we're jumping locations. Um, this is part of what's so exciting about bringing these different voices together. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Malcolm Ferdinand, is an environmental engineer from University College London and holds a PhD in political philosophy from Université Paris Diderot. He is now a researcher at the CNRS, the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique in Paris. Um, and his work, which is at the crossroad of political philosophy, post-colonial theory, and political ecology, focuses on the Black Atlantic and particularly on the Caribbean. So Dr. Ferdinand explores the relations between current ecological crises and the colonial history of modernity. And in fact, recently published a book based on his PhD dissertation that was entitled, or that is entitled, A Decolonial Ecology, Thinking of Ecology from the Caribbean World. So with that, thank you so much for joining us, Malcolm, and we are all ears. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I apologize, I do have a little eye issue with the whole craziness, but I'll try to do my, um, my, my, my talk anyway. Um, I, I was moved by the first um, three uh, presentations and I, and I could um, reply to many of, of what has been said. Um, en bel bonjour pour vous en même de, de Haïti. <laughs> uh, ça fait un plaisir tendeo. Um, and again, there are a few things I, have. <laughs> I hope we can we can talk about in the, in the discussion. So um, this this event is about 
provocation on what justice means and what, what it could mean. So I want to title entitle my provocation um, to a slavery as ecocide. Uh, very, very simple. Uh, it's a proposition um, that comes out of my, of, of my book, as uh, Amma has, has uh, um, already introduced. Um, a few words about me before that. Um, what has not be, been said is that I was born and raised in Martinique. And I spent the first 18 years of my life on that island. And Martinique is uh, a different kind of uh, marginalization from the from, 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 from France, as uh, Mme Fatouignang already highlighted, especially with the impoverished suburb. Here you have the French overseas territories and so on and so forth. And funnily enough, I, I, I did 15 years of um, um, secondary education in Martinique, and not once did I, was I allowed to speak Creole, to, 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 to go back. Not once was I uh, introduced to many writers like Condé, Césaire, Fanon, Glissant. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but thankfully, education is not only at schools, thankfully. Uh, but yeah, um, so to go back to the point of my provocation, we have, come, we have come to know a lot about slavery or what slavery was, uh, especially I'm referring to transatlantic slave trade and to, a, um, to, to, the, to, to, to slavery itself. Um, since the 20th century, we had many historians, anthropologists, digital scholars, artists that have enriched our perspective on what slavery was. I, I could give many names, but of course I would leave some out, but uh, a, a few comes to mind, Tony Morrison, Henry, Henry Wigate, Derek Walcott, Césaire, uh, David Eltis and the Slave Voyages uh, project. Of course, we know that the reason why such research was possible is because there were movements in the streets, uh, cultural groups, uh, activists that fought, you know, and we can name many movements, the civil rights, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Jean Davis, Rosa Parks, uh, the marches in France, uh, the same 98, uh, but different anti-racist group, um, the work of Fanon, César Glissant, all the way to the Black Lives Matter movement, and the current movement for repression of, of slavery. Now, these movements also had an impact on what was taught in school and what was possible in terms of research, research that we could do. And of course, we should not forget the most important reason why we are here. I speak as a descendant of many survivors to slavery. The powerful resistance of a number of people who, despite the horrifying conditions of slavery, were still able to pass on not just life, but dignity, kinship, not just body, but love, not just knowledge and education, but spirits and soul. Now, this precious belief from our ancestors basically says it that we are worthy of love, that we matter, we have the right to live and inhabit the earth within equality, dignity, and justice relations with other people, regardless of their skin, creed, faith, complexion. Now, I say all of this as a start, just to acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of giants, truly giants who have come before us and we have, we are, who has, they have allowed us to do the kind of work that we want to do today. And we too share a responsibility to carry on that belief to the, to the next wave. Now, as a provocation, I want to suggest that the plurality of ways slavery has been understood in scholarly work and activist and cultural organization have perhaps relegated the environmental, the non-human life component in slavery and the slave trade to the background. Now, there remains a classical definition of slavery and understanding of slavery as a system of domination and oppression of and dehumanization of people. Of course, this is a perfectly valid definition of slavery. However, it fails to encompass the environmental dimension of slavery. It fails to, and it falls into the, the modern dualism or more precisely what I've termed in my book, the, the double fracture of modernity. That means the fact that we separate to a fault environmental history, environmental theory, environmental issues from colonial and slavery histories, theories and resistances. Generally, it's not the case for all, but generally. And in order to envision what justice now 
could be in the wake of Europe colonial and slavery past, I think there's a need to revisit that understanding, understanding of slavery, revisit that understanding of slavery and colonization. I think there's a need to position slavery also as a form of ecocide. Now, why or what for? The first point is it allows to acknowledge the continuities between the enslaved and the land, between humans and non-humans. It essentially allows one to take into account the intrinsic relation between human domination and environmental destruction. Now, the colonization of the world by European imperial powers, as uh, Brian um, re reminded us, um, induced both the subjugation of indigenous people and enslaved around the world and the plundering of the environment. More precisely, the domination of indigenous people were a condition for the exploitation of the land and vice versa. The colonial exploitation of the environmental uh, ecosystems became the reason for the dominating domination and dehumanization of indigenous people. So basically highlighting the continuities that sometimes we have been accustomed to, to perceive uh, differently. Now, secondly, what goes for the land goes also for the body. Slavery as ecocide is not just the acknowledgement of the damages that slavery has done to the land, the plants, the animals, or the non-human animals. It also includes the damages done to indigenous and enslaved people as integral part of the environment themselves. Um, and what does it, what does it do to, to conceive of slavery as, a, as an ecocide? It allows to move beyond false solution of what justice could be. Slavery as an ecocide means it's no longer, to it's no longer possible to accept justice or emancipation as being only a policy regarding the body uh, or the humans as the breaking of chains or the, or the granting of social and human rights. Of course, these are important um, uh, milestones that have been achieved. However, it, as, as if in the case of France in 1848, for example, the second abolition of slavery, um, it's, it's, to put it simply, it's no longer possible to, to think, okay, we're gonna, we are gonna be free in the land that is still uh, being plundered. What France has done past 1848 was put in place different measures to bring back the formerly freed, the formerly slaves, sorry, the newly liberated back to the plantations. Um, so in other way, and of course, let's remind ourselves that abolition is not justice, it's just the end of an oppression is not the achievement of, of, of justice. Um, in other words, what does it mean to be free from slavery if this freedom is to be lived in a toxic ridden land, or in, or in a land that is constantly being plundered. This is a case, of course, of, of one instances in Martin and Guadeloupe, because we are still being plantation societies, more or less, and we have been contaminated by an, um, different toxics, different pesticides, but one in particular that's called Chlordecone. It used to be fabricated in the States, uh, keep on. And to give some, um, to give some example of, of what this movement mean, um, I, I wanna show you one protest that took place um, a, a few weeks ago, if I can share my screen. I hope I can share my screen. Yes, I can. Um, this is just 30 seconds. And to me, this is one example of the uh, cases where the struggle to preserve the environment and to have safe environmental conditions of living goes hand in hand with the necessity to um, have justice for the slavery and colonial past. Um, and this is one of the most important uh, demonstration that took place in, in, in Martinique uh, to this day in terms of uh, environmental issues. And usually in these demonstrations, you will have discourses and, and pieces of art that would position the, the, the fight for the, for the environment as an anti-racist, anti-colonial uh, struggle. Yeah, this is this is a, a flag of the national uh, nationalist uh, flag uh, in Martinique. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, and then the second instances where these two 
environment and entire colonial environment and entire racist uh, theme came together would be what happened last year in, um, in 2020. Uh, Mam Fatou Young uh, pointed that there was this major wave of anti-racist movement in France that uh, maybe some of us have never seen. I was part of some of these demonstrations and I really felt like, you know, it was really, really important that we could bring down all the buildings and it was very powerful. And that summer, um, we, of, most of you know the case of uh, the, the committee Adama Traoré about this uh, young, um, young boy that was killed by the police and that for no justice has been done. And usually it has been, there, there's been a divide between environmental movements and anti-racist movements. And for the first time, um, I'm gonna show you one picture. That year, there was this joint movement, um, if I could just share my screen, a, a joint demonst demonstration, um, he here is, you have just a, a few pictures, a, a, a joint demonstration called, you know, Generation Adama, Generation Climat, with the, the, the phrase, we want to breathe. And breathing mean, meaning both, we don't want to be choked by the policemen, the, using the chokehold techniques, and we want to have living conditions where we are safe from the pollution, from the air pollution. And that was just one example of the way we need to bring these two issues together. And for me to conclude, slavery as an ecocide is an, epo an important point that has many, many ramifications and that we can go, we can go and, and, and explore. And the, the, final, the final line, um, Positioning slavery as ecocide means that whatever form of justice we need or we find or we can imagine, we need one where there is a renewed relationship with the land. And interestingly enough, in my opinion, it is via a renewed relationship with the land that we can undo the kind of the, the century long dehumanizations that has been taking place. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Malcolm. And um, across your presentation, and Michelle is reminded, thank you for, I haven't said that we've I've focused on the colonial past, but really we're talking about colonial and slavery past, right? And their and their legacies and afterlives today. Um, and so thank you very much for this um, this reminder of the, the distinctions that can be drawn between the non-human and, um, and the human and the ways that in fact, bringing back um, the connections and making those visible is both can be both, um, can be part of this decolonial effort and effort of um, to bring justice. So, and I really love this thing about breathing and, and you know, I, I can't breathe as a result of police violence, but also as environmental violence um, equally. So lots for us to talk about. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and so just as the environment is, um, or environmental justice might not be at the forefront of people's um, conversations about, or are thinking about what justice for the colonial and slavery past might be, um, I think sometimes foreign policy, kind of these bigger picture questions about the relation between the global north of these former colonial powers and, and the global south of former colonized um, populations maybe falls to the background, maybe because it seems so very intractable. Right? Maybe we've come to accept that the, the relationship between France and its former colonies will always be the same. Um, but, and this is why I'm so delighted to welcome uh, Shada Islam for, um, as our last presenter um, on this panel. I'm so excited for our discussion um, to speak to us precisely on this question of foreign policy and how it relates to these questions of justice. So Shada Islam is a respected and well-known Brussels-based co commentator on the European Union who now works independently as an advisor, analyst, strategist, and commentator on Europe, Africa, Asia, geopolit geopolitics, trade, and inclusion. Um, and she now runs her own Brussels-based global media strategy and advisory company, New Horizons Projects. Um, prior to this, she was Director of Europe and Geopolitics at Friends of Europe, an influential independent think tank based in Brussels. Um, and she's also currently Senior Advisor at the European Policy Center, as well as non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. And recently, Shara Islam um, published a, um, an op-ed, a piece in The Guardian titled, um, 
Europe can only fix its relationship with Africa if it exorcises its colonial ghosts. And this is exactly sort of the, the point of entry into this conversation about justice for this past. So thank you so much for joining us, Shada, and we are all ears. We can't hear you, Shada. Yes, yes, no, that's fine. Even after a year on Zoom, Amma, <laughs> we still go through this. I didn't know if, whether you were going to do it. No, thank you very much, Amma, for inviting me. And thank you, Lillian, as well, uh, from Avocat Sans Frontières. I'm delighted to be here. Yes, absolutely right, Amma. So what's happening in geopolitics and foreign policy and its links with slavery, colonialism, racism, are not something we talk about very often, but I believe that the conversation is starting for many of the reasons that Mom and Brian talked about. So I'm gonna circle back a little bit and bring in what they've been uh, saying to us, which were fascinating discussions so far. Thank you so much. So, you know, for years, um, issues to do with colonialism, slavery, racism, diversity, inclusion, Islamophobia, all of these words uh, were taboo in geopolitical circles, foreign policy circles. They were just sort of, the elephant in the room that nobody really talked about. And that was true for the global North. And I have to say complicit in it were also countries in the global South. So it wasn't just a, a one way situation, not just the global North to be blamed. And here in the European Union, because what I'm doing here is really working a lot on EU affairs and what mom said about France being colorblind and you know, always talking about this as an import from the West and you know, let's stop having a color from, from America, I mean, and let's stop talking about identity politics and all this ca uh, cancel culture. This was very much also the narrative here in Brussels. And uh, that's, no, that's no surprise, France being such an important member of the European Union. Um, and then there was also this feeling, uh, Amma, that you know, member states of the European Union, uh, Britain, when it was a member, France and all the others, they have their colonial issues, but we, European Union, we are a virgin birth. You know, we are a new creation, a new regional organization. We are free of all this burden uh, that member states carry. So let them deal with it. And we'll have our own sort of um, fresh uh, relationship with countries of the global south. Um, and I would also talk about, you know, uh, Asia as being part of it, rising Asia and China. So we'll have our new fresh conversation. The past has nothing to do with us. But actually what we're finding out now more and more is the past is the present. And a number of uh, entanglements and frustrations that people are having in their relationship with the European Union uh, have to do with the colonial legacies. And Africa, of course, is preeminent uh, among those. But let me just say that the mood and the conversation here in Brussels is changing, and for two reasons. One, of course, um, I have to say the Black Lives Matter movement has had a big impact, and both Brian and, and Malcolm and Mom and everyone has talked about it. it, had a huge impact, not just in the member states, but also here in the European Union. And the EU's first reaction was to say, well, this is something that's happening elsewhere. These things do not happen in Europe. We are colorblind, race is not an issue, we're all equal uh, before the law. And when these protests erupted and colonial statues were toppled and there was an outcry of uh, Europeans of color saying, we also can't breathe, that came as quite a, quite a shock to the European Union. And I have to say that some member countries, including Germany, Angela Merkel, even the Netherlands under Mark Rutte, very quickly came out and said, yes, we have a problem with systemic racism and we have a problem of actually recognizing people of color as full-fledged European citizens. We have to change that. And then very quickly here in Brussels, the conversation turned to um, the same issues. Of course, the pandemic, meanwhile, let's not forget we're living in a pandemic, had also done two things. First, shown that people of color, Europeans of color, were really victims of, of the pandemic more than the white population, the white citizenry, if you like. But the second thing the pandemic revealed, Amma, was also how the essential workers, the frontline workers, were people of color. Um, you know, uh, across Europe. So there was this dual kind of recognition that came through. Very quickly, the EU adopted an anti-racism action plan, the first ever in the history of the EU, um, which recognized institutional racism, unconscious bias, but also something that's very, very important is Brussels is very white. 
Uh, there's a whole campaign that I've been part of for years and years uh, called Brussels So White. Uh, and that's not just the EU institutions, but every organization in this bubble uh, linked to the EU, think tanks, academia, consultancies, the press. Um, you know, I've been, I've been a reporter, a journalist, a think tank, and often I was the only person of color, uh, the only um, of, uh, person of color, woman and of Muslim descent. So, I mean, you know, talk about intersectionality. So it's, it's been there. Um, and so the one area, so, so, so the anti-racism action plan is very internal and looks at issues that are very essential to, uh, to us here in Europe as citizens of Europe, recognizing us. There's a long way to go. There was an anti-racism summit, the first ever uh, I moderated it. It was on Friday. And, you know, there was a lot of excitement, but a lot of frustration around it as well. But, you know, baby steps were taken. But, but, and this is important, none of this has to do with foreign policy, security policy, development policy trade policy, nothing to do with geopolitics, it's all internal. And that conversation is, is going to be extremely difficult because it means for the EU as part of the West, and I'm going to talk about the Western America in a minute as well, rethinking our place in a world, uh, which a world which is changing very fast. A world that is changing very fast because more and more countries, uh, the Chinas, the India, South Africa, Brazil, uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, these countries are not going to sit back any longer uh, and take lessons uh, from, from, from the North, from the West, from the former colonial past. The idea that and you can be rule makers and rule takers, you know, uh, that has changed. China has changed it to a large extent, but other countries have done so as well. So when you start talking about foreign policy and race and colonialism and slavery, it becomes very complicated because you're really talking about power dynamics on the global stage. Uh, and that conversation, as I said, is, is just, just beginning. Very few scholars, some of them, uh, Dr. Tony Hastrop, who you all know, obviously University of Sheffield, she's one of the pioneers in that conversation and one of the rare ones. So, um, so it's the it's the elephant in the room, and let me just talk a little bit about um, about Africa because that is something that I think is where colonialism intersect with slavery, with racism, and also with Orientalism and the Middle East, where of course Islamophobia is a very dominant narrative, whether we like it or not, and migration, where you also have race and. Uh, Pride and Prejudice, as I call it, I, I wrote a piece uh, for The Guardian on that as well. All of this, it, it's really, uh, once you start unraveling this rather toxic package, uh, it's very dispiriting to see how much of the things we take for granted when it comes to uh, policies are really deeply anchored in a very Eurocentric uh, Western primacy, Western superiority, neo-colonial approaches. It's very disheartening, very dispiriting how, how deep that goes and how difficult it is to actually even look at it and talk about it in a, in a civilized, mature manner. It, it, it breaks something very deep within uh, European institutions and I, I would argue even American uh, view of itself on the global stage to engage in that conversation. So at the moment, the EU, um, uh, as uh, you, you may know, uh, it said that in the article, is trying desperately to have a, a new conversation, a so-called equal partnership with African countries, with the African Union, 54 countries. Africa, of course, uh, now being seen as the real geopolitical prize, if you like, not least, let's be very frank, because China is now a big player uh, on that chessboard, right? Uh, so you have articles, <laughs> in magazines and like the, the Economist, you know, using very, very deeply uh, racist language, I have to say, uh, the scramble for Africa, going into the heart of Africa. I mean, all sort of, you know, codes that take us back into a very dark uh, and unpleasant uh, references. So, and, and, and so the EU is trying desperately to revive and make itself the dominant, if you like, uh, I was gonna say power, but at least the economic, uh, interlocutor for Africa, especially as it embarks on this African free trade area, which is you know, a huge area like the European Union. Um, and it's trying to do that. And over and over again, over the last year and a half, um, the Africans have been saying, yes, 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 we'll do something, but there hasn't been a very, um, let's say, uh, 
motivated response, not a very encouraging response. Um, and, and so I went, I, I thought, okay, let me just try and understand what's really happening. Because as, as I said to you, um, Africans themselves as, as leaders and, and, and statesmen don't like to talk about it. We just saw, uh, you know, we saw um, a little clip that I think Malcolm showed us. Um, about Macron going and you know speaking about uh, Africa and Europe and France and all the rest of it, but no French, uh, no African leader comes out and says, "Hey guys, th this is you know we're not going to do something like this because you know you uh, they need European money, they need European trade, they need European markets, um, etc." So I went, to, I started digging a little deeper. I spoke to quite a few of my friends, and it became very obvious that unless and until. Uh, Europe collectively, not just the member states, you know, uh, collectively Europe, the European Union comes out and recognizes that colonialism and slavery weigh heavy uh, on this relationship, unless they come out and actually publicly make perhaps a statement saying, not apologize as the European Union, but show, at least recognize that this is something that lingers on. I think, I believe really sincerely that this relationship will never take off. This idea that you can have an equal partnership when the elephant in the room is never, ever, ever tackled or discussed. It's just not going to happen. Um, so, the, you know, there is a, this Fortress Europe conversation. I'm going to just very quickly say to you why I worry also about what's happening uh, with America is back under Joe Biden, because that's very much also foreign policy and the European Union, as you know, considers itself to be a strong ally of the of the United States. And there's a lot of discussion about transatlantic conversations on this and that, uh, including on uh, geopolitics and how you work. I mean, America is back also, I have to confess, worries me a great deal, makes me very uneasy because it's once again a declaration of we are the hegemon, we are the imperial power, we are and we, with our allies in Europe, you know, all of us white together. Uh, um, I know America is plural, uh, pluralistic, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's the Western primacy, the narrative is very much uh, white centered. We're going to run the world again, you know, um, and we're going to do it together. Um, makes me very, very uncomfortable because that us and them narr narrative that is used internally, uh, the othering um, of, of, uh, of people of color is now being projected onto the global stage and denying that countries across the world now have power and agency and um, need to be recognized as full-fledged players on the global stage. And every time I talk about um, the WTO, the World Trade Organization or security or Syria, Afghanistan, um, you name it, um, it all comes back to the same thing. We are the white saviors. You know, it's the white savior mentality that's embedded in the development policies of uh, many of these countries uh, of the EU per se as well. And nobody comes out and recognizes it. I'm very uncomfortable myself, but I, I find that it's the only way forward. We have to break that. We have to break that box. Um, we have to shake it up. And then we can really build a new order. Because going back to the way things were even four years ago or two years ago is just not going to be possible. And you see that now, um, I'm going to end with that. You see it now with this issue of the vaccine, the pandemic and the vaccine. I mean, if we are equal partners, if we are working on a global stage and we're really collaborative and, and you know, working with each other, why are we holding our vaccines? Why are we, you know, we should be sharing it. And that's what a number of countries are saying. Um, you know, we need no vaccine nationalism, but it has to be access to vaccines. So, you know, you have to waive uh, patent rights uh, and allow India and South Africa to produce these vaccines. So, unfortunately, um, this is not going to go away. Uh, we live in a world where it's very much uh, on geopolitics, foreign policy, us and them, um, extreme competition because uh, one nation, two nations, three nations are standing up and, and raising their head of the parapet and saying we're equal partners, we're part of this new order, uh, we have to be taken seriously. So very deeply rooted in, in our discourses, our narratives, and in our media, unfortunately, as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Shada. Thank you for bringing us back to the context of the pandemic, right, and, real, and showing us some of the ways that these dynamics are playing out in life 
I mean, all, everything we're talking about is ultimately life and death situations, but even with regards to the pandemic, um, the bodies that are most at risk or that have been most, um, whose vulnerability has been brought to the fore most and these questions of the vaccine. And also for highlighting the links between the internal issues, the questions about, um, about the, 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 the European, the makeup of European societies today and, and um, the, these descendants or folks from different backgrounds, as they should put it in shorthand, the links between what it means to manage that and the and foreign policy, right? And the fact that it points to this this history that we're trying to to engage over the course of the next few days. Um, so thank you all for these fantastic presentations, so rich and and just so thought provoking. Um, I would like we're going to run over time, my apologies to our audience members, but I would like to take, you know, I say 15 minutes for those of you who can stay, please stay with us. Um, I would like to first maybe give you a few minutes um, if there are questions you would like to ask of each other or things you'd like to engage of each other. Um, and, and maybe before, and we have a couple questions in the, um, in the chat, um, but, and I think, Okay, I will come back to this in a second, but let's let's source maybe if there are pressing issues that you would like to be able to um, speak to each other on, I'd love to, to create space for that. And then we open up to the broader discussion. Um, and to the MVP folks, are is everyone visible? I'd love to have all of us, all the panelists visible on screen right now, if possible. So I think, I mean, I can start. Please. I think that um, I don't have a particular question. It's more a comment. Um, and I think that this is also what justice looks like, what just happened. I was left very emotional, um, you know, at, at hearing you guys and, and, and watching, listening to Malcolm talk to, you know, to blackness in this French context. And I realized that um, we are both black. We, are bo we both have dreadlocks. We are both university professors in a French context. And that, that, that's a lot, that is a lot. Um, I will not develop more, but yeah, that left me very, very emotional. And it's hard, it's very, it's extremely difficult to have this conversation in a French context. And, and yeah, I mean, I think it was mostly yeah, a big thank you for, for you guys for opening these spaces and um, where we can look at each other, listen to each other and, and you know, expand, like you say, our sensory experience and the way we, we thought about these issues. So yeah, it was mostly, um, you know, a big thank you. I don't want to take too much time. No, thank that, you. Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that. And just this looks like. <laughs> absolutely, right. And actually, and to expand on that, right. So there's the different, the different margins that are represented in, in your experiences, as Malcolm said, um, of the banlieues and then the, the island of the islands. And then there's also then the, the, Haish, the Creole connection, right, yes. across these yeah. different, um, yes. these different diasporas yeah. also, right. So yes. there's so many ways that the stories um, intercut one another. And perhaps one, yeah. um, oh, Michel, please go ahead. Gonna say yes, that. so I wanted to also follow up and say thank you as well. Uh, and I, you've been doing an amazing job, Emma, putting this together. And I, I'm so pleased to get to meet um, powerful scholars. And in fact, I was telling Bran that um, this work needs to be part of our curricula. So I, I look forward to including more of your work in, in, in the curricula. And I have a question for Shada on a very concrete level, which is that uh, I believe that we have to engage the courts. And, and from what I know of your work uh, in Europe, I would, I would beg you for some advice on how to, because the European Union is so powerful in Haiti. So there's this notion of a core group in Haiti that includes France and Canada and the US. And, and, and basically, they are the ongoing colonial powers in Haiti and in much other places in the world, as we heard about Africa, those maps that, that were shown are, you know, those cancer maps are just harrowing. So on a concrete level, what can we do? So I mentioned that I've engaged Africa Sans Frontier and they put me in touch with actually two very, actually three um, folks in Haiti working on human rights issues. And we're hoping that we can get some traction in the court to, to, to call the Haitian government to actually respect human rights. Uh, so, Shana, do you have any concrete advice on how to get the European Union and its court system engaged in making sure that those injustices, like as we saw in those maps, 
stop because if there's one thing to talk at in this in this forum but what can we do concretely to to push the agenda forward with about justice really may i answer Anna? yeah directly Please. so uh michelle thank you thank you very much for that so there is a very interesting dynamic that is underway now because the eu used to be very very focused on states so it was very much a state-oriented conversation so the eu would engage with the, the the government of haiti yeah and the government of congo and the government and and now increasingly under pressure from people like myself there's also an engagement with civil society and I think that is something uh, very, very important that has that's So the EU is in a, in a, a, on a learning curve in terms of you know, how it responds. How it's, it's, it's a newcomer to the scene. And that's what's quite interesting as the EU, I mean, not as France or as um, Germany, et cetera. So th there is this conversation that has started, which is very much engaging, especially with women. Uh, civil society has become a very important stakeholder in EU foreign policy, EU development policy. Um, and is helping to change that attitude of just interacting with the elites of a country. So my, my suggestion to you would be to actually, because there should be a human rights officer, as they call them, in each and every, each and every EU delegation, as we call them. And I would, uh, I would encourage you and your, and, and your um, friends to actually try and engage with that person, because in principle, that person is meant to exactly do what you're talking about, is to raise awareness of human rights issues, human rights abuses, um, discrimination, and, and issues like that. So that is the normative power, as we call it, of, of the EU, which is in action and can be a force for good, um, in fact. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So actually, so there's a question that I think is from the audience that speaks to everyone, and then I have individual questions. So I'll give you the question from the Q&A that um, um, we can speak to collectively and then direct my questions to you. Um, so the question is from Hanu. It says, anything characterized as universal versus a particular has been perceived as the ideal that cannot be renegotiated. So how can we show those universal values as articulated so far from the perspective of the dominant West? Right, um, and hence fail, falling short of reflecting the realities of Black and other marginalized communities. So I read this as a question about how do we both make visible the fact that the universal has never been neutral, at least in its current articulations, and how do we um, sort of repopulate or reanimate the universal with the range of um, the range of us? Right. Um, so I think that's a question for all of us. And questions that I had directed to you individually. Um, Mom, I'm really, you know, you spoke, you spoke so poignantly about how you learned of Black Frenchness once you left, you know, and you said, you know, like in this choice that, that La France, either France, you love it or you leave it, we left. You know, I'm really curious to hear you speak about this question of where, what does it mean to be Black and French and this question of staying in France versus leaving, um, knowing that in the US we have our own problems, <laughs> you know, and, and this is sort of the, the predicament of blackness, right, to use Jamima Pierce's um, term that, you know, white supremacy and anti-black racism follows us no matter where we go, right, and it might take different forms. But so I'd like to hear you kind of reflect a little bit more about your positionality and this question of staying versus leaving. Um, Brian, I'd love to hear you speak um, a bit about, I mean, so, you know, you occupy, speaking of positionality, such an interesting position as, I'm assuming, an African-American um, and involved in this transnational um, sort of movement, right, both that had roots in South Africa and that you were involved in very significantly in the UK, and now you're teaching in um, in Memphis, and so the, this, this place where also, this place where space is also hotly contested, and so I'm wondering, and you work on Black internationalism and Black radicalism, so I wonder how you kind of how you make these connections or sort of how these different aspects of um, your experience and your own positionality inform and illuminate um, the struggle on, you know, the, the European front, the British front, um, and the American front, for instance. Um, Malcolm, I'd like to, I'd love to hear more about, um, you talked about the renewal of relationship with the land as kind of the, what justice would look like. And, I'm, and I, I'd love to hear more about that. Like, what is that? Because um, sounds, it seems like it's not just about. In order to even renew the relationship with the land, we need to recognize that there is a relationship with the land, and there's a kind of a re-education and reattuning to our environment and our surroundings that seems foundational to that. And so, I'm curious to know, sort of, what is going on on that front that is um, 
that excites you that you feel has um, holds promise. Um, and Shada, my question has to do with it's kind of cynicism might not be the right word, but kind of what to make. So it's one thing to say that the EU has to um, has no choice now but to wreck because the, the African Union, the African continent is the new geopolitical prize. And, you know, we've been there before, right? Um, so in a sense, it's nothing new. And so, but that the fact that now you have China and you have other um, actors on the stage, there needs to be, you know, we need to be, we Africans need to be taken seriously. Um, and so, and that the starting point for that is recognizing the past. Um, what do we make of the fact that of sort of the motivations for recognizing that past. Does it change anything that it comes from if it comes from the same place of um, potentially an extractivist logic or the same place of having access to resources, right? Um, the question of trust to me comes up pretty importantly um, because I think that's really what's in play here. It's not just about Macron saying, yes, we are equals. It's like, well, can we trust you? Because for, you know, for a couple centuries, this has not been, you know, the question of trust hasn't really been, um, or, you know, yeah, you understand what I mean. It's been kind of a complicated relationship. So what is it, what is really different about this approach um, today, you know, or this new orientation? Um, and Michelle, I am, I, I continue to be struck by both the, 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 the commitment that you bring to this question, it's intractability, you know, like this, this debate about the place of Creole and the relate in the place of Creole in relation to French and um, tying to what's been said elsewhere, almost the complicity of the elites in, in, in this, in the situation that you're trying to have an impact on. And so I'm curious to hear about how you negotiate these power questions um, and the positionality point comes again, you're working in an American institution um, that gives you a certain kind of access. And I imagine to some extent you have to work through, in, through state institutions, even as you try to subvert what they're doing. Um, so I'm curious about the ways that you engage with this range of actors. Um, yes, in trying to, trying to do the very important work that you're doing. So that's a lot. And I will just, <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna do it all, but I needed to get it out there. So I would love to hear from you. Um, go, whoever starts first. Okay, I can start and, and get this out of the way. And actually I wanted to tie, um, you, you know, answering your question with a question that I received in the audience that said, um, to be black in French, explain the neurosis. Well. Um, my family has been French for six generations, right? And this citizenship is neither a subject of shame nor, you know, an object of particular pride. It's just the reality of our history and as such should be recognized. And for me, and um, this, this, the recognition, the acceptance of blackness in the context of the, of the French Republic is a vital question. And when I say vital, it's in the literal, in the literal sense of it's a matter of life and death. Um, the French Republic, you know, since the Fifth Republic is said to be one and indivisible, une indivisible. And so it does not recognize race, but also sex, religion as a valid category of analysis. In my work, I've mentioned in my, in my presentation, I've mentioned police violence, right? We have numbers, we have official documents, official sh studies showing that black and Arab males are disproportionately targeted by law enforcement for profiling and also police violence. We have studies showing that women of sub-Saharan African descent have a maternal death rate five times that of white French women. And I've talked about, you know, environmental issues that are disproportion disproportionately affecting um, uh, industrialized areas, this banlieue, the, you know, the outskirts of French cities, and Malcolm um, spoke about the, you know, the, the, the Claudicon scandal in the Antilles. So we have situation affecting racialized communities, mostly brown, you know, Arab and Black, but we are left unable to address them because of the silences and denials around race. So when I say that I'm black and French, I am not begging this country to accept me. I am just asking that the entirety of you know, something that was constructed around me be accepted because for me, my sister, my mother, and people who look like me, it's a, it's a question of life and death. And here also enters the US, and this is how we'll segue into your question, Amma. Um, I'm part of a generation, you know, born 
the beginning of the 80s where we realized and I talked a little bit about that in my movie you know I was a really I was a good student in school but I lied to my mom to you know when the the parents teachers meeting were because my mom was six foot she, she was this tall you know um Senegalese lady um and she didn't look like the mother that I saw growing up on TV. She didn't, for me, a mother was a white mother, you know, that, that you will see on um, Club Dorothée, she smelled of incense and curie. And I was ashamed because for us, blackness was not something, actually Africanness was not recognized. We equated blackness with, you know, the African migrant, with the African migrant being kicked out of Eglise Saint Bernard, with, with kids, starving in utopia this is the only i mean blackness was invisible and that's one of the reasons actually i made my movie we were invisible on screen on front right so we were told that we are french but every day in your in in life you realize that you are not i was the only one as a teenager having to go out with my id card so you are not african you're not black or at least the way your parents wanted you to be and also you realize that blackness is not really something that you want to be appointed with i mean you're 10 you're not you're 10 right you're not we're not politicized at 10 then you realize very early that you're not french right everything around you screams you are not french and i'm part of a generation i'm going to be really fast with this that realized um you know at the beginning of our teenage i'm talking you know um, the middle middle of the 90s that actually france loved blackness but african americanness you know michael jordan michael jackson the first black doctors that i saw on tv was cliff axtable right so um americanness became as in the usa became you know the talking for blackness for us the type of blackness that we wanted to buy for and that's one of the reasons that it explains you know the 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 development of, of hip-hop and we actually dive into to a hip hop culture because we could hear, we could understand, we could feel and understand, you know, what was happening, whether it was in Oakland, California or Harlem, New York. But then, as you say, um, growing up and, you know, once we were able to, to travel for the first time in the US and also understand the extent of black experience in the US, we realized that it was not the best country in the world to be a black person. And then in that, and, and, and you know, we, did, we talked about a lot about this with colleagues like Mabula Sumao and Rokaya Jalo. So in all this peregrination between the places that our ancestors or parents or grandparents or great great grandparents came from in Africa to the Caribbean, to us, you know, being into reggae music in Jamaica to the US, we realized all of a sudden that we belong, we didn't, didn't really belong to any of these places and we had to come back. And for us coming back was coming back home. And for me, home is France, even though I live in the US, home is France. But then I realized that I am French, but with a little bit of Africa, a little bit of, of the Caribbean, a little bit of U the US. And for me, this is what it means to be Afro-French, that I am French in the context of blackness and in the context of this development, you know, of the, the colonial history of and everything that it entails in France, but bringing the second identity that 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 I developed throughout my life, but that also was created and was before my birth. So yeah, that's that's complicated, and that's what we're working on. Well, I could I could go on the whole day, but I will just you know give um my other co panelists the opportunity to answer the question. Merci. <laughs> thank you for that, um, Shada. Were you? Thank you for that, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Shada yeah. and then Brian. Uh, yeah, thank to, you. Oops, sorry. I have to leave. I have to teach in 10 minutes. I have a oh. class. Start. So I was right. hoping if I could say my piece and then run. Please. Yes. Sorry to be running over. Yes. It's okay. And I, yeah, I, I'll just, I'll try to be brief because I, I do need to get ready. But um, yeah, I just wanted to build on what Mama said, because, you know, for me, in my experience, I, I faced similar issues. You know, I, I was born in the U.S. Um, to a Kenyan, Black Kenyan father and white American mother. Um, and I grew up, but I grew up in white spaces, you know, with my mom's family because my parents split when I was very young. And, um, and so, you know, learning to be black, figuring out blackness, like that was a big part of my journey. And um, just to speak to your question about the sort of global, you know, having gone to school in Oxford and I'm now based in Nairobi, Kenya because, um, you know, I was here and I can teach online in Memphis from here. And anyway, it just, the, 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 the more I, I go through the world and see and learn and, and read, blackness seems to be um, far more of a fundamental or foundational uh, blackness and anti-blackness, <laughs> uh, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, th I, think, I think there's a consciousness emerging 
quite recently, relatively recently, about the ways in which anti-Blackness is a specific form of oppression in and of Absolutely. itself. That's, that's overlapping with white supremacy, but not the same. Um, and so, you know, and, it's, and it's, it's a bit controversial because, you know, people of color who are not Black, um, I think can sometimes be caught off guard because on, on the one hand, there's an effort to oppose white supremacy by, you know, Asian people, Arab people, um, people from Latin America. But in these places, there's also a lot of anti-Blackness. And so in Roads Must Fall, we found people who were really uh, committed to overturning white supremacy, but also practicing a certain unconscious anti-Blackness. Um, and so I think that most, I think that's another reason why some of the most cutting edge um, and generative work in Black studies right now is that which is exploring the relationship between Blackness and, and humanness and the category of human and the ways in which um, Blackness and slaveness have become uh, sort of linked in the global unconscious uh, and, and, and what that has meant, you know, for the ways in which we conceptualize a lot of things, the ways in which we think and the ways, the ways in which we, we discuss things. Um, and so race, it's not just race, in other words, it's, it's Blackness <laughs> that is at the foundation of all of the sort of racial hierarchies and, and discourses um, because you find anti-Blackness everywhere, right? All over the world and in, in, in all different types of countries and, and communities. Yet, I don't think it's gotten the, the sort of um, attention as a framework as much as class or as much as, um, you know, gender, which are also both very foundational. Um, I think Blackness and anti-Blackness are, are very foundational. And I think that's what's emerging now in the starting to emerge at least um, in Black studies. But thanks again to everyone. I got to run. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good class. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, you. you're welcome. Shada? Yes, Amma, thanks. I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, what Mama said about uh, looking to America to know what, uh, uh, you know, diversity and inclusive sort of uh, societies can be. And that seems to be or at least aspire to be. And, you know, I've just noticed now how European politicians are so, you know, they admire Kamala Harris and they, you know, she comes and, but no one like that has emerged in Europe, right? I mean, we don't have a European Kamala Harris. Uh, when Amanda Gorman spoke at the inauguration, everybody was sort of, you know, uh, is swooning over her and saying, oh my God, isn't she wonderful? We have uh, Amanda Gorman's in Europe. Nobody has brought her forward. So I think sometimes a transatlantic discussion on race and its uh, uncomfortable sides could be could could be quite good. I'm um, I'm not saying everything is perfect, but I think uh, Europe and America need to have that conversation and bring people of color, uh, black brown people, people of color, Muslims, Jews, to talk about it together. I think that's important. I think also Europe has a big problem with identity, and Mama has talked about it. You know, um, there is this Im implicit, tacit understanding across Europe that it's white and Christian, and anything that goes against that norm and that narrative, that group think, really um, jolts the, you know, jolts the anchor of Europe. This is European identity, fluid identities, inclusive identities. You can be, you know, Asian and American. Here, it's very rare. You can be British and Asian, but European and Asian, European and African. These are new concepts. They're developing thanks to people like Mama. And finally, you asked me about Europe, and I'm a great believer in, in the European Union. I like its story. I like its uh, concept. I like what it's doing. And I think for African countries, it can be a very good partner, uh, not just for markets and not just for investments, but also a good partner in terms of learning certain things, mutual learning about living together in this world, you know, but to do that, to actually have this kind of coexistence where you recognize each other as, you know, equally important, you need trust. And I believe that trust can only come when you have a very frank conversation. And it's not about reparations, it's about respect. And that respect has to come in. And unfortunately, uh, Amma, with some of our current um, African leaders, it has to be with civil society leaders. It cannot just be with the state. And that's where the conversation has to go. As I was saying to Michelle, it needs to involve the people, the students, the women, the trade unionists, you know, the, uh, the parliamentarians, you know, it has to go there um, to the mayors, you know, cities. Um, it cannot just be with African states. That has to change. Thanks. Mm, thank you for that. Yes, that's, 
oh, that that opens up a whole the question of like this the engagement with the state versus civil society. I think I, I hear you, and I think it also opens up more questions about um, sort of the legitimacy and 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 of states and the from what points that a legitimacy gets um, challenged, right? And 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 with what implications? But we'll I'll just leave it there. Um, Malcolm, I see you've demiked, demuted, so. You're next. Yeah, um, before I start, I just, because I, I took part in the demonstration uh, Saturday, I just wanted to show some flyers of uh, what was going on. So to, to pick it back on what Chada was saying, you know, the, 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 the ongoing struggle by civil societies for, this is against Islamophobia. There was a demonstration against for uh, people without, um, without papers. Um, and this, is, this was organized by the families of people that some of the people that, that have been killed by police pol police officers with, with with the names here and then the little collectives of like, you know, um, yeah, we, we, we want to have a better, we basically want to be recognized as human beings. <laughs> it's um, it's simple. And, and to go back on what mom was saying, I think there is a, um, regarding the question of universalism and it, it, it faced with the particular. Um, and what it means also, as Mam was saying, of people like looking like us becoming professors or researchers and so on. We, we have been throughout our education, um, we, we have had an understanding of what type of bodies are recognized, our bodies capable of producing knowledge. And, up, and even today, it's not really, it's not that common that bodies looking like us are recognized as, as producers of knowledge. And, and if you go to universities, in my university, there is a, um, a stratification, a racial stratification of the person who, who does the security, cleans the floor, serves you food in, in a restaurant, print the photocopies, and then the, pe the people that are president of universities, director of research center and so on and so forth. And so it happens that sometimes I don't fit <laughs> in, that, in that category. But um, to go back more specifically to your question, um, what I wanted to highlight is the fact that we need to understand that we're not just humans, we are humans on earth. And that being on earth is not a circumstance, is a condition of our humanity. And that means that we cannot claim or reclaim our humanity without also having a conception of what it means in terms of our relationship with the land. And of course, as you, uh, as you pointed them out, um, the history of colonization, of slave trade and slavery is um, a deconnection from, fr from the land collectively. Of course, you had the enslaved having Creole gardens uh, in, in the Quilombos in, in the maroon camps and, and so forth, being able to, to have some form of resistance with the land. But in, in Martin and Guadalupe, for example, in Guadalupe, our um, plantation societies, the vast majority of people do not know what's going on in the plantations. We don't decide what to cultivate, what to export. So we've been contaminated, more than 90% of our population is contaminated by this carcinogenic and endocrine disruptor. Yet, none of us really chose this pesticide. None of us really chose to cultivate bananas. And even the bananas that were cultivated, we didn't eat them. It was sent to mainland France and Europe. And that means that we also need to, uh, in order to look after ourselves and our body, we need to be able to have strong environmental democracies, being able to decide what to cultivate, how to cultivate, being able to what does it mean to be free in a land that is intoxicated, contaminated? This is why I think there's a need for a renewal of the land because getting justice is not, especially if, you, if, if justice is understood only as a, a um, decision by the court, is not enough. We need to invent new ways in which we can relate to the land and, and via the land relate to others. So we need to imagine both ways of relating between other human beings, but also between or within other non-humans. I think this is a task that we have to face now. We, we cannot 
the, the, the danger of that double fracture where we separate anti-racism, colonial history, uh, and then environmental and issues is, is that there is a, a small group of people that will occupy and monopolize uh, all that is to do with environmental theory, environmental issues, environmental questioning, environmental... If, if you look and you take some uh, manual or anthology of environmental thoughts, especially outside the US, because the US has, a, has its own history, but in Europe, for example, you have a hard time finding a black person in there. And the, and the, and the, the problem is that then you have um, um, the idea that an ecological issues is only important for, or, or only thought of by wh white people or, 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 or white group. And, and as we know today, most of the impacted by climate change, by different global warming, by the loss of biodiversity, our people, uh, racialized people all around the world. And that means that we also need to reclaim um, the way, the concepts, the policies in which we can um, deal with these issues. And by doing this, reclaiming our, our dignity and humanity. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, and and I and I it's it's one of those things that you hear and becomes immediately evident, right? And yet it's not at the forefront of the discussion. So thank you so much for bringing that and spelling it out for us. Um, Michelle, do you have the the particularly challenging? This is the thing with Zoom, right? On one hand, it's amazing because it allows us to bring all these people into a space from the comfort of their living rooms. But then we didn't, we couldn't, you know, fly you over and lock you here in the room and keep you with us. So everyone has meetings on the other end of this. So we're slowly losing our panelists and our audience. But we're going to hear. I want to hear you, Michelle, um, and then we will close out in just a couple minutes. Yes, what you've asked, am I? It's such a challenging question. Basically, you've asked how to navigate both the power centers in Haiti around that issue of, of really human rights and education. And then you've also asked about my own position at MIT outside of, of Haiti. How do I maneuver around these two um, issues? So first, the personal, um, because I think that that might, I mean, it's a very complex answer, but that might help um, getting some insight on, on what you've asked. So actually, in my case, you know, because I grew up as part of the Haitian middle class and I did all my classes in, in French, and my parents could speak French. So it was like oxygen. In fact, I understand white supremacy from the perspective of me being in Haiti and just assuming that because I spoke French, um, everyone should speak French. In fact, just yesterday, I had a debate with a childhood friend of mine arguing with me that why am I pushing Creole when he and I could learn French, could succeed in French? But I said, don't you understand that you and I were part of the 3%, 5% at most? You see, but he cannot move outside of this way of thinking that if I could do it, then why can't they do it? You see, it's, we, have a, we have a problem in Haiti that says that wash the blue, pas condule, wash the soleil, literally the rocks in the, in the water, in the river, cool rock, doesn't understand the pain of the rocks in the sun. And, and that's what we're dealing with. So, but once I left Haiti, I was able to understand these, these mechanisms because I, I experienced racism based on my skin color. But in Haiti, I was the one perpetrating uh, another kind of racism through language. So it took me leaving Haiti to understand these patterns and also becoming a linguist. And I could understand that how for the first 20 years of my life, I was being miseducated. You know, basically it's a classic canon, um, phenomenon of you know, black skin, white mask through the school system, and which is still present in Haiti today. You see, and, and, and now I'm able to actually bring the best of MIT to Haiti to try to solve this issue. But often, actually, now you ask about my position at MIT, and people in Haiti, those who want to work very reactionary, want to keep the study school, they'll say, well, Michelle is from MIT. He doesn't understand Haiti. He doesn't get it. He thinks that Haiti is like MIT. But fortunately, <laughs> and this is something which is very powerful, from the very get-go, our initiative was what we call a combit. A combit means that it's a gathering of people who come together to fight for a cause and they do it because they believe in it, not for money, you see? So from the, from the get-go, we're able to incorporate a critical mass of Asian students and faculty. And in, also, very importantly, uh, teachers in teachers' unions. In fact, so these teachers are now, they're just waiting for, for there to be more movement, a legal movement for them to join. And that's why you know, I was very happy when ESF agreed to put me in touch with some 
um, lawyers in Haiti to try to push this fight forward on the legal front, you see, and those teachers are ready to join. Um, now, in terms of navigating the, the power circles in Haiti, so MIT Haiti, we're quite happy to collaborate with anyone. In, in fact, we, we look for collaboration from the Ministry of Education, from UNESCO, and, and but what's clear is that we're very consistent. Now, we will collaborate to the extent that those institutions respect what the law says, that Creole is national, the national language. We have two different languages. So once you respect that, and once you understand basic principles for education, meaning that the use of Creole, then, then we'll, we'll collaborate with you. Actually, UNESCO is a good example in mind because as they themselves produce research on the importance of um, local languages of mother tongue, they themselves in the fancy meeting, they violate those principles because they have those meetings in French only. So as I collaborate with UNESCO, in fact, right now we're collaborating on, on, on improving some current materials and we do it with much happiness, it's a great opportunity. But at the same time, I also challenge them um, the power structure when they exclude Creole. And that's why I have this slide where clearly you know, I have these examples where they do violate um, those basic principles of human rights. So, uh, and, and that makes me think of Shada's point about how we can use these NGOs to try to push human rights. But sometimes those three organizations like the UN um, having meetings in Haiti about cholera and having the meetings in French, when most people dying of, dying of cholera in Haiti do not speak French. You see, and that's the UN, that's in this quote, having meetings about um, inclusion in French, which excludes most Haitians, you see. so so. I try to be consistent. We can do both. You know, we can collaborate when you're willing to be part of this um, framework, which is which respects men's rights. But we challenge them when they don't do that. You see, so um, I hope that gives you a sense of of the various how complex your question is, but also the various ways um, to get at it. Um, but this is just the beginning, so I'll I, I stop here. Emma. Absolutely. But, but again, thank you for your question. No, thank you for that. And I think what has come out through all of the answers, all the presentations and all the answers really is the fact that, you know, this is a complicated issue we're dealing with. And so, and it's messy and, and it requires intervention on multiple fronts and, and it requires sort of this, this uh, what's the word I'm looking, muddling through, you know, the mess of it. And I think, um, you know, this is such an inspiring combination of, of, of presentations because it shows us that even in the messiness, just how much is being done and how much possibility there is. Um, and this is really what we wanted to foreground today, right? And, and thinking about what can, what can and what should justice look like. So I'm so grateful to you all for sharing your work with us um, and, and, you know, and joining us and launching us into the coming week. And so grateful to our audience for sticking with us even though, you know, through the Zoom challenges. Um, and um, before we lose everyone, I just wanted to remind folks that our next session starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. Boston time, 3 p.m. Brussels time. And tomorrow's session will be on opportunities at the supranational level, um, tying back to um, what you're speaking to, Michelle, for um, justice for this past. So we'll have folks from the UN, from the EU, um, from the Open Society um, Initiative in West Africa, and from Avocats Sans Frontières, um, talking about what these, these um, efforts for justice for colonial and slave past, um, slave trading past, and slavery past look like and what's possible at their level. So again, thank you so much to Michelle and Malcolm for being um, here with <laughs> us. Thank you so much to our translators, Camille Copé and Daniel Leonard, who have worked so hard during the session. And I really hope we can make this video available because I think it was just so inspiring and so enlightening. Um, and thank you to the MVP production team, Tom White, who's been our tech director behind the scenes. Um, I wish you all a lovely day and look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow on Zoom, 9 a.m. Thank Boston you, Alain. Time. This is really super. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you for putting it together. And nice to meet you, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs>